Thank you for joining us today for our Epinephrine First and the Role of Benadryl in Anaphylaxis webinar. I am Jennifer Gertz, Executive Director of Food Allergy Canada, and our guest speaker today is Dr. Wade Watson. May is Food Allergy Awareness Month, and this year we launched our Know It, Treat It campaign in an effort to raise confidence in treating anaphylaxis. We want to demystify anaphylaxis and empower all Canadians to know what the signs and symptoms are and how to treat anaphylaxis. There are several ways to get involved, including your participation in today's session. Please check out our campaign on our website for other ways that you can engage. Before we get started, a couple of housekeeping items. Note that this session is for informational purposes only and will not provide specific medical advice, recommendations, diagnosis, or treatment. Please talk to your doctor about any concerns or questions that you may have regarding your own health or the health of your child. All participants are muted so we can keep the audio clear for the webinar. Thank you to everyone who submitted questions on registration. They are, uh, there are some consistent themes uh, that have emerged and we have uh, shared those with Dr. Watson and it's been used to inform today's webinar. If you do have some additional questions during the session, please submit them in the chat and question box throughout the webinar and we'll try to get to as many of those as we can. And note that the webinar will be recorded and shared on foodallergycanada.ca afterwards. Now, before I introduce Dr. Watson, we'd like to frame up the session with our viewing audience in a couple of ways. First, with a poll on the comfort in using epinephrine auto injectors, and then we'll share some feedback that you provided to us on registration. So first, the poll. How comfortable are you in recognizing signs and symptoms and using an epinephrine auto injector? Everyone could take a moment to complete the poll. Okay, you've got 18% who are very comfortable, 40% uh, that are comfortable, we've got some that are not comfortable, and 34% somewhat comfortable. So that kind of gives us a sense of where the audience is today. The other thing that we asked you on registration is what causes you to hesitate in using an epinephrine auto injector? And while some of you noted that you would not hesitate, and others said, well, I've never had to use uh, this, here are some of the themes that emerged. Uh, during this uh, this collection of data. So first off, not sure or confident in recognizing when to use an auto injector. The reaction doesn't appear serious enough to use it. Epinephrine auto injectors are expensive and I don't want to waste a dose. The belief that an epinephrine auto injector may cause pain or discomfort. Some concerns around using the auto injector incorrectly. Concerns around side effects. And lastly, the need to go to the hospital if epinephrine is used. So with that as background, I'm delighted to introduce our guest speaker uh, for today. Dr. Wade Watson is a professor of pediatrics at Dalhousie University, head of the Division of Allergy at the IWK Health Centre, and chair of the Specialty Committee, Clinical Immunology and Allergy for the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. He is also a member of our advisory board. I'll turn it over to Dr. Watson. Uh, thank you very much, Jennifer. And I, I also want to thank Food Allergy Canada for this opportunity to speak. Uh, we're all sort of uh, in COVID mode, for, as you know, for the last 14, 15 months. So speaking about something other than COVID is actually quite fun. So again, the title of my presentation, uh, I, I will talk about the role of Benadryl in a moment, but it really is epinephrine first. And just, I'm a pediatric allergist, so I've been seeing children now, my goodness, well, including my training since 1986. So, you know, my, my major focus is going to be speaking about children, um, you know, so, uh, you know, many of what things that, that I say will also be applicable to, to adults as well, but I'll just express that comfort level in the begin with. The other thing is, is that I also wanted to frame this this time by 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 doing a, a little survey as well. So I'm going to give you four cases, which are really variations of the same case, and I want you to think about each case, and I, I want you to to respond as to whether or not you would give epinephrine in in this particular in this particular situation. So the first case is a six-year-old girl who has a sesame allergy. She has hives and starts coughing repeatedly 15 minutes after a snack, and she's distressed. So my question to you is, would you give epinephrine? So your choices are yes, no, or uncertain. So we'll 
post that first one, please. So we have 68% yes, 8% no, and 24% uncertain. Thank you. So we'll move on to the next one. And we'll I promise we'll come back to these cases at the end. So the second case, now I've just, it's a slight variation and I've highlighted the what's a little bit different in blue. So it's the same girl, um, and but she starts coughing and she doesn't have any hives 15 minutes after a snack. You give her water and her cough does not settle. So in this situation, would you give epinephrine? So again, your choices are yes, no, or uncertain. So I have 27% yes, 26 no, and 47% uncertain. Thank you. So we'll move on to the case number three. Again, um, slight variation. So now the same girl has asthma and a sesame allergy. She has a blue inhaler, which is a rescue inhaler salbutamol. She's had a cold for three days. And now she starts coughing repeatedly 15 minutes after a snack. Your cough does not settle with water. Would you give epinephrine in this case? So we can post the poll. So 23% yes, 41 no, 36 uncertain percent. Thank you. And I have one other one. Um, so similar case. Um, she has asthma and sesame allergy. Now she's had a cold for three days and she's been using her blue inhaler at least once to twice a day. Now she just starts coughing out of the blue. The cough does not settle with two puffs of salbutamol. So the question is, in this situation, would you give epinephrine? So your choices again are yes, no, or uncertain. Thirty-one percent yes, thirty-three percent no, thirty-six percent uncertain. Thank you very much for that participation, and I promise after at, at the end we'll come back and look at these cases, especially with the information I hope to provide you, and uh, and 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 hopefully this will frame sort of the the, the next few minutes. So the overall goals for for me for your uh, for the participants is that. Hopefully that you will be empowered to respond to suspected anaphylactic reactions and be confident about your decision to use an epinephrine auto-injector. The specific learning objectives, again, by the end of this presentation, I hope you'll be able to describe the signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis, describe the reasons for epinephrine being the first-line treatment for anaphylaxis, discuss the role of antihistamines in the treatment of anaphylaxis, discuss the importance of early recognition and treatment of anaphylaxis, and again, using cases, the ones that I've talked about, to improve your comfort level with managing possible allergic reactions. So I have two key messages for you. And, it, and this is really the, the major thrust uh, of, of the presentation. If you think the allergic reaction is anaphylaxis, use epinephrine. And you will not cause serious harm by using epinephrine. So I want to give you a, a, a definition, which I modified the World Allergy Organization last year, um, uh, mod uh, had a, a position statement um, on anaphylaxis. And, and I, I translated it into, uh, took, took away all the medical speak, I hope, um, but anaphylaxis is a ser serious, undesirable reaction produced by the immune system. It comes on quickly and unexpectedly and it may be life-threatening. Now, what the World Allergy Organization did in order to try to simplify um, uh, the diagnosis of anaphylaxis is they uh, modified the situations where, where they, they feel that anaphylaxis could be diagnosed. And many of you may have heard that there are three situations. The World Allergy Organization has reduced it to two, and I will go through those with you in a moment. 
And this has been endorsed by our own Canadian Society of Allergy and Clinical Immunology. And also those definitions are now used uh, by a system called TREC, which is Translating Emergency Knowledge for Kids, which is the emergency departments uh, and uh, university pediatric uh, departments across Canada are using this definition in their emergency departments. So there are two uh, definitions. So either a rapid onset of skin problems, so that's either itching, hives, flushing, or swelling of the lips, mouth, or tongue. And I have a picture there to, to indicate what you'd be looking for. Plus one other, one other system involved. So either it's breathing problems, so cough, shortness of breath, wheeze, or strider. Now strider is a sound when you get obstruction in your upper airway. So um, the sound that you would hear is every time uh, either yourself or a child would breathe in, you would hear a whistling sound. So it would be <coughs> versus a wheeze, which is a musical sound when you breathe out. Or you could have circulation problems, which would be a sudden collapse or fainting due to low blood pressure, or severe abdominal pain or repetitive vomiting. Or anaphylaxis can also be diagnosed in a situation where you've had an exposure to an allergic trigger and you have breathing problems, again, cough, shortness of breath, wheeze, and or the strider, which I indicated to you before, or you have circulation problems, such as so a sudden collapse or fainting due to low blood pressure. Now, it's important to know that not all anaphylaxis is life-threatening. So, Anaphylaxis may have mild symptoms uh, that may that respond quickly to treatment. You can also have a, a airway symptoms only with severe wheezing or strider, or you can have you know a, a a reaction with respiratory failure, low blood pressure, or hypotension plus loss of consciousness. Now, the important thing to understand is, you know, what affects the, med the medications we use for anaphylaxis? What, where do they work? So I just want to go through epinephrine, which is, is the, the second column after the body system versus an antihistamine. So for, from a breathing point of view, epinephrine opens up the airways. It helps to relax its muscles and reduce swelling in the airways. So the airways be, uh, rapidly open. From a circulation point of view, epinephrine raises the heart rate raises the blood pressure, and it helps the heart to increase its contraction. So if it counteracts that low blood pressure or circulation collapse that occurs. Uh, epinephrine also affects the immune system, the, uh, the cells that are part of the um, allergic reaction called mast cells release a number of chemicals, one of them including histamine that's responsible for the allergic reaction. Epinephrine actually stops the ongoing release of those mediators. So it actually works uh, to um, suppress further release of the mediators that are triggering anaphylaxis. And for the skin, epinephrine actually reduces hives. And antihistamine in, anti in, in, in anaphylaxis does one thing and one thing only, it just reduces hives. So epinephrine and anaphylaxis, the importance of early use is that you get a better response if used early in the reaction. The side effects of epinephrine are mild and disappear quickly. So you can get an increased heart rate, which is what you want. Um, you, you get pale skin because it contracts all the little small blood vessels. You can get a little bit of shakiness after the use. Um, and uh, some people experience some nausea, but those things are temporary. Now, Benadryl in allergic reactions, Benadryl is the brand name uh, in North America, the active ingredient for Benadryl is something called diphenhydramine. It is an older, what we call first generation antihistamine. And the major issue with regards to that is that it, it does cross what we call the blood brain barrier and causes sedation, okay? And so the, the drowsiness that occurs with Benadryl is similar uh, and similar brain activities of blood alcohol of 0.1, and so it may inter and it may interfere that with those emergency department assessments. So what I explain to families is that that's like giving your child a martini. Okay, so you, you, it doesn't it doesn't ha contain alcohol, but because it causes that 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 uh, effect on brain activity, it has that same same action. 
There are three epinephrine autoinjectors currently available in Canada, and they are shown here. The EpiPen, which is on that lower left, which is the one that's, that most people are familiar with. Allerject is now back in Canada, um, and again, with the 0.15 and 0.3 milligram. The other uh, device that's, that's now available in Canada is a device called Amarade, and that's in the upper right corner and it comes in two doses of 0.3 milligrams and a 0.5 milligrams. Now, there has been a number of concerns expressed about the use of epinephrine, and I, I, I cleaned these specific ones uh, out of an article from three years ago and added a couple uh, of my own. But one of the major, one concern that's been expressed is that epinephrine should not be used in anyone with a history of cardiovascular disease. And I want to reassure everybody that that any cardiovascular events that have been recorded are rare and are associated with improper dosing or administration. So either the dose was uh, given was too much or uh, sometimes in adults, if they have an, an intravenous, so the, the epinephrine uh, is actually given through the vein and goes directly to the heart, which can cause significant effects. But when it's used by uh, intermuscular roots, so into, the, into a large muscle in the leg, it doesn't have significant cardiovascular effects. Second concern that epinephrine autoinjectors cannot be used in infants. And again, uh, um, our Canadian Society of Allergy have made recommendations for children less than 15 kilograms, including less than 10 girl 10 kilograms, the 0.15 milligram dose is, is perfectly appropriate to use. Again, for 15 to 25 milligram, uh, kilograms, the 0.15 milligram dose, and again, for 25 kilograms and over, uh, the 0.3 milligrams would be appropriate. A third con uh, concern is that the ep epinephrine auto injections, injections are harmful. So that means if they're used when they're not needed, does it cause harm? or it may cause significant injuries. And again, a uh, review of the literature, there are no reports of significant harm. I mean, it reinforces the importance of proper training and practice so that you have a, have a trainer device, you know when to use it, and you practice how to use it. There are certainly reports of cuts and abrasions in children related to them kicking or moving their leg, and the imp that just reinforces the importance of stabilizing the leg when it's administered and again, to address that, um, the device hold time uh, recommendations, re at least for the ones that you actually have to hold the device, is reduced from 10 seconds to three seconds to reduce that risk. Uh, fourth concern, and the whole issue is epinephrine is dangerous, so if you use it, you must go to the emergency department. And again, I really want to reinforce the emergency department visit is recommended due to the allergic reaction, not due to the fact that the epinephrine has been given. And the reason why for that concern is the symptoms may continue to progress and you may require additional therapy. So that's why monitoring in an emergency department would be important. And there are concerns with what we call biphasic reactions, so recurrence of symptoms after improvement despite no additional exposure. Now, I did read a recent paper that suggested that risk in, in, in reality is probably around 5%, but it is a potential risk. So you, that's why that monitoring is required. The other concern that's been expressed is that the, ne the needle in the auto injector is long. And I wanted to give you some, some very simple ways to think about the length of the needle in, in, in the different auto injectors. So on your left with the, the EpiPen and the Allerject, if you look at your thumb, the length of the needle is basically the width of a thumbnail. The MRA device is slightly longer, so it's about the width of your thumb completely. And just to compare so that when you, you go for a, an immunization, I mean, the, the length of the needle for, for that device, for the regular thing is from the edge of your thumb to your joint. So you can certainly see that the relative lengths there um, to give you some idea. So I want to go back and review the case discussions. And so I'll just go through them and I will just remind you of your responses. I very quickly writ had written them down. So that first, uh, a six-year-old who has a sesame allergy, she has hives and coughs repeatedly 15 minutes after a snack, and she's distressed. So 68% of you thought you would give the epinephrine, 8% said no, and 24% um, and was uncertain. 
and again, and I can understand, I, these are, I, I made them appropriately big because you need to ask some other questions with regards to this. But, you know, but you do have skin plus breathing problems means anaphylaxis. So you had rapid onset. So, you know, she did have a snack. We don't know for sure if she has actually um, had ingested or had eaten anything with sesame. But according to our, our definition, this would, this would translate to anaphylaxis. So it would be appropriate to use epinephrine and again, go to the emergency department. Now the second case, slight variation. So this, she just started coughing, but has had no hives 15 minutes after a snack. You, she has given some water and it doesn't settle. And again, in this situation, would you give epinephrine? 27% said yes, 26% said no, and 47% of you were uncertain. And again, I, I, let's look at some questions because the big issue is what did she eat? Because I think it's, it's important to, to know that. And more importantly, was there any potential sesame exposure? So two questions you can ask and try to sort of sort that through. So if there's been no exposure, it's appropriate to watch. But again, I mean, I really want to reinforce that the symptoms are persistent or worsen. I mean, again, there's no downside of using epinephrine. If there was potential exposure, again, so you have potential exposure to something you're allergic to and you have respiratory symptoms, that would satisfy that second, that second def, uh, uh, definition. So it would be appropriate to use epinephrine. And again, if you're uncertain, and again, this is something I've reinforced over the last 30 years. If you're not sure, it's, it, you use epinephrine, they're really, you're, you're trying to do what's best. Uh, and in that situation, epinephrine would be appropriate. And more importantly, if you give epinephrine, you go to the emergency department. So the third case, again, six-year-old, she has asthma and a sesame allergy. She has her blue, blue inhaler. So she has salbutamol that she uses as a rescue. She's had a cold for, for three days. And now she starts coughing 15 minutes after a snack. She doesn't settle with water. Again, would you give epinephrine in this case? 23% said yes, 41% said no, and 36% were uncertain. And again, it's I just slight variations. So now you have asthma as part of the of the issue, and that happens quite often uh, with with children. With they have more than one uh, issue that you're dealing with. So again, the question is, what did she eat, and was there potential sesame exposure? So there's been no exposure, it would be appropriate to use your blue inhaler. And again, you're gonna watch closely. If it's if this cough is related to the cold and the asthma that she has, it should, it should really start to improve quite quickly. So again, if, it, if there's no exposure, but she's not getting better, or it seems to be worse than with five minutes, you can repeat your blue inhaler, because is this asthma? That's the big question, and that would be appropriate. But again, the issue is, epinephrine may be indicated in this situation uh, because the symptoms are worsening. And certainly epinephrine was a treatment that we, we used in the past for severe asthma. So again, you, you can make that choice. Um, if there was potential exposure, it would be appropriate to use epinephrine. And uncertain exposure, again, I'm, I'm, there's a recurring theme here. You get, I would recommend giving the epinephrine. And again, the emergency department visit is your next step. And then the fourth case is that six-year-old with asthma and sesame allergy. Now she's been ill for three, three days. She's used her blue inhaler a couple times each day. And now she starts coughing out of the blue. So really, you know, it's, it's not related directly to eating. Uh, you, all, you give her some Ventolin or some, some Salbutamol and she doesn't get better. So the question I asked was, do you give epinephrine in this situation? So again, 31% said yes, 33% said no, and 36% were uncertain. So a third, a third, a third. And again, I think it's, it, it, it is it's vague. And again, you need to ask yourself some questions. So when did she eat would be helpful. If it's been more than two hours since she ate, then that would suggest that perhaps an allergic reaction would be less likely because you know we would expect the symptoms to occur immediately or within a couple of hours versus less than two hours. Less than two hours, it certainly would raise your, your suspicions. And again, what did she eat? And was there any potential ex uh, sesame exposure? So you have the, if it's yes, no, or uncertain. So if there's no exposure and it's more than two hours after eating, 
You can repeat the salbutamol and watch closely. If there's no improvement, she's getting worse, you would repeat the salbutamol. So then you have to wonder, are we dealing with a significant asthma episode? And so that you could do that if there was some, if you're, if you're again, if there's uncertainty, you could give the epinephrine. If there's potential exposure, again, you give epinephrine. Uncertain, you give epinephrine. Again, the same thing, you would go to the emergency department. So with that, I'm gonna open it to questions. Thank and... you, Dr. Watson. Let's turn on our webcams. Okay. Thank you. I mean, we've got a number of questions and, and a good amount of time to go through those. So um, where uh, I'd like to start uh, is let's go back to signs and symptoms, okay? And and I think the symptom that we want to first explore is skin, okay? Right. So because we know you know that's the one that you see, but let describe for us again the type of uh, things you might see if there is a reaction involving skin. Let's start there. So I mean, the, the most the, the most thing, easy thing is hives. So so white, raised, itchy bumps that are you can feel them if you if you touch them. They're usually surrounded by by a red area. So hives would be the mo one very common thing. Um, the second, uh, the second thing, you might just get a generalized flush, so the skin becomes very red, very inflamed, and again, tends to be itchy as well. So those would be the two major things. The other things you may notice would be what we call angioedema, so swelling of the lips, mouth, or tongue. You may have uh, swelling in other areas of the body as well. Okay. Now, if you have an itchy throat, is that associated with the skin symptom? Like, where so does that fall in? Well, see, that's again. It depends upon upon the the um, the severity of that. So, you know, the I mean, part of the issue is that you can have. There are some people who, for example, if they have pollen allergies, may get a mild itch in the back of their throat when they when they eat fresh fruits or fresh vegetables. But right. so it's a it's a mild itch. But if, I, I guess the thing being thing, if there's significant um, itch and, and you know it's very uncomfortable difficulty swallowing then then that to me would be an inside symptom that would be more significant that i would take seriously okay so we've got a skin symptom and yes. and based on the definition skin alone is not uh, anaphylaxis but what would you do to treat that would you treat a skin symptom with benadryl or antihistamines like what is the direction if you're only seeing skin so my advice to, to families is that if there has been exposure, only seen skin symptoms, that I would watch and to, to, to look for presence of any inside body symptoms. What I find what happens, people get very focused that they're going to use an antihistamine. And if they use an antihistamine, they're not really monitoring for those other symptoms that you would be looking for. So the breathing symptoms, okay. the vomiting, that sort of thing. So to me, it would be a matter of watching to see if you get any of those other any of those other signs of of uh, anaphylaxis. Okay, so you see a skin skin symptom, you're going, okay, let me watch, let me watch what's yeah. happening next, and then let's go into okay. So the things that then take that from being an allergic reaction to anaphylaxis, we talked about breathing circulation, severe abdominal pain, breathing. Let's dig right. into that. Okay, so what do we see when we're seeing a breathing symptom? So cough, 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 okay. Okay. All right. That's clear. Yes. So, and that's, and then the, and, you know, again, if you get swelling in your, in your upper airway, you get that, that sign, which we call strider. So, so there, there would be struggling to breathe. There'd be use of muscles here that you would, there would be really uh, a, a um, uh, lots of effort. You might hear wheezing, which is, I can't, I cannot mimic right. wheezing. I've tried in the it's past, the whistle. but it's a yeah. whistling, <laughs> okay. it's a whistling sound when you breathe out. But again, you're going to be using these muscles here to really push you because you're trying, your airways are constricted and you're, so you can breathe in, but when you try to, to breathe out, those airways sort of start to narrow so that you, you, 
you get you get a whistling sound when you breathe out and you're using the muscles in between your ribs you're using the tummy muscles to really push to try to force that air out of the lungs you use the muscles up here that also that also um will will uh, there's really a, extra work in breathing so okay. that's the thing okay now what about if you're getting kind of nasal congestion i mean is that a is that i mean it's been explained kind of previously if you're starting to see nasal congestion is that considered a breathing symptom well i mean again it's 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 the related degree i mean a little bit of nasal itch i'm not worried about a little bit of nasal stuffiness but you know certainly uh if you think i mean you're really looking for those things that are significant or severe so if your nose gets really blocked you know uh, again you have and you don't have any other symptoms mm -hmm. it's worth it's worth watching i mean you know i've had you just been outside and are you pollen allergic yeah. you know i mean and so it's trying to sort of sort those through as well okay. but you know certainly um you know that in and of itself wouldn't be satisfactory for that breathing type of issues because it's yeah. more upper airway okay now let's talk about circulation because that was the other sure. so skin plus circulation explain to us the things that we're going to be seeing when it comes to a circulatory symptom so the big thing is, and I mean, and again, I think part of that, I mean, a low blood pressure. So when you see, you know, sort of that somebody having problems with blood pressure, what would what you would notice is that decreased level of consciousness, that they feel, they might feel, I mean, an older person might feel dizzy, they may feel lightheaded. They feel that that they're going to, 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 to faint because they're not, they're not getting the blood to their head. Um, those would be the be, be the biggest things. Um, you know, the other one that happens is that sense, people always talk about that sense of impending doom, you know, mm -hmm. and again, you know, is that directly related from the heart type of reactions? You know, I think that, you know, it's, it's because, you know, if you're having trouble with low blood pressure and your heart's trying to get blood to your brain, and you're not getting the blood there, I mean, that's where you start seeing that, that lightheadedness, faintness, those sorts of things that would be that would be the things that I would be and your heart rate would probably increase because your blood pressure is dropping so your heart starts to really try to pump more right. in order to to get that to get the blood to where it needs to go so you'll be feeling that and your heart would be really trying to racing in your chest as well okay great now I think the last one sub, severe uh, abdominal pain or vomiting I think we can all relate to that one that's probably pretty um straightforward how long like if you see hives is the first manifestation or some sort of skin symptom you know how long do you really have to observe for those to see whether it those other symptoms appear when do you what's your perspective on well that? i mean again if you if you look at the strict definition and again the strict definition i'll be honest drives me a little crazy as an allergist because you can say you can have symptoms up to two hours that's uh, you know those symptoms cannot come on within two hours in in my experience um you know really we're talking within minutes i mean it's very you know the skin plus things things happen you know but they usually happen within minutes but the official definition says up to two hours afterwards and again i would say 95 percent of any of the histories that i have heard over the years or when we do food challenges, for example, in our clinic, those symptoms come on fairly quickly. Okay. Okay. So that that was criteria one: skin plus A, B, or C. And then, and now we're talking about the other situation where you're right. going to be either breathing or there's a circulatory issue. So right. again, what, is that again? It's going to be a rapid and onset. Describe yes. that kind of scenario too for us. Well, I mean, the thing that the, the subtle difference between the two, the first one is you don't have to have an obvious exposure to a potential allergic trigger. If you have a sudden onset of those skin changes plus one other body system, which we talked about, then, then that satisfies that criteria. The second one is that you've had an exposure to a known allergic trigger and you have either respiratory symptoms or those cardiovascular symptoms. By definition, uh, that would be considered anaphylaxis. And, the, and again, the World Allergy Organization was looking for some, just making it simpler uh, right. so that you can, uh, you know, again, if you have those symptoms and you've been exposed to a, a known or potential allergic trigger, 
then that would satisfy the definition. So this, okay. the, the the symptoms that we've talked about, that they mentioned before, would be exactly the same. There would just be no obvious skin changes. Got it. Okay. You could still have skin changes if you had an exposure with an exposure to neurology and had skin changes plus plus those symptoms. That still satisfies the definition. But the first definition, there's no obvious exposure. You have skin plus those. The second one, you've had an, an, an obvious exposure. Okay, so one of the questions that came in through the chat was, if a child is coughing only, could we use an ice pack on their neck, give water and closely monitor? And I guess what you're saying is that if there's a known exposure, then that might not be the action. Would well, that... so one or two coughs, I mean, children cough, right? So, but it's, but in this sort of situation, you know, if there's been a potential exposure and the cough is significant, I mean, it's not one or two coughs, cough, 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 cough. I mean, it really, there's a sudden change. They went from perfectly well to, to, to really coughing incessantly and it's progressing. Then, then again, if, if there has been a potential exposure, they're known to be allergic. The issue is, is it's, it's, it's the epinephrine is the treatment of choice. And the question is, do they respond yes or no? Okay, okay, great. A um, couple of other uh, questions, uh, again, on signs and symptoms. What do you look for in an infant? Is it, you know, what, you know, given that you can't get that feedback necessarily, what are the signs sure. and symptoms you should look for in an infant and how should it be treated? Well, again, I mean, you know, for children less than one year of age, I mean, you know, it really that the clear things, I mean, the skin, is going to be exactly the same. I mean, you know, hives, flushing, that sort of thing. The issue that comes down with 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 children and or infants and or babies is they they go from happy to being very unhappy. You know, again, um, either you know incessantly crying. You know, if I mean again from abdominal symptoms, they may be pulling their legs up, but they they're crying. They're very uncomfortable, and it's happened shortly after the, an exposure. But if um, breathe again, cough, be cough, 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 cough. Uh, that strider they were taught, you still may be hearing that. But the children go from being well, so the breathing, they really are distressed. Or, you know, certainly I've had children when I've done food challenges that have severe, you know, severe cramping and abdominal pain that really comes on quite suddenly. So they go from being perfectly well to being very uncomfortable. Okay, okay. Now, uh, last thing around um, signs and symptoms. Uh, what's the situation where it's, well, this is not, more, not necessarily signs and symptoms, this is more around treatment. In what situations is it not okay to give a shot of uh, epinephrine? That's maybe a hard question to answer. <laughs> so, when, so when it would be inappropriate? Yeah. I mean, my, my simple message, I'll just go back to the simple message. If you think that you're, that, that the, the child is having a, an, an allergic reaction, you believe it to be anaphylaxis, then it would be appropriate to use the epinephrine. Okay, okay. Well, so that relates to our next question because one of our one of the uh, members of the audience asked around what are the levels, like are there levels to anaphylaxis and do you new, use epinephrine in all, in all situations? And it sounds like you're saying so yes. So if the answer is yes, you know. And again, you know, it, I mean, the analogy I use with families and I, you know, it's kind of like being pregnant. You can't be a little bit pregnant. So, you know, if you're, I mean, if you satisfy the definition of anaphylaxis, you know, the tr the issue is the treatment is the same. You would use the epinephrine. And again, you're looking for a response to treatment. So the symptoms are, are mild. The, the reaction should reverse very quickly, but even if they're moderate to severe, you, the, the earlier the use uh, of the epinephrine, the better off in general you are. You're trying to reverse that, those signs and symptoms, and you're trying to stabilize those allergy cells so they're not releasing further chemicals. So that's going to you know, perpetuate or prolong that reaction. So, I mean, earlier is better. Okay. And if you're not sure, if you're not sure, then I would use it. Okay, okay. Let's go on to some questions specific to epinephrine. Um, doses for kids and adults, let's remind our audience about that. And also, when do you think about using a second dose or readministering? So the doses for, you know, for, for children less than 15 kilograms, and, and again, uh, is the, the 0.15. Um, there is not a, a 0.1 dose currently in Canada for, for that. So we would use the 0.15 milligrams. For 15 kilograms to 25 kilograms, 
we would use again the 0.15. Once you get it above 25 kilograms and above, um, you would think about the 0.3 milligrams. And the, the 0.5 milligrams, which is the new MRA device. So again, if uh, as an adult, um, you know, that, um, you know, certainly over, over 50 kilograms, you, you could have the choice between the 0.3 and the 0.5. There, is n there are no studies looking at, at what is the appropriate dose, but, you know, in general, if you have, you know, if you were a 100 kilogram individual, you know, perhaps thinking about the 0.5 milligram would be appropriate. Okay. Now, can you also go through uh, for us, Dr. Watson, how you actually administer uh, the device? Okay, just in terms of what, what are the, the, the steps that you need to think about when you're using the device? Are you talking about the actual yeah. steps? Yeah, like where do you, where do you apply the, the auto injection? Oh, okay. And what position, body position should you be in, that type of thing? Sure. I mean, and, and again, it depends if you're giving it to yourself or to a child. Yeah. I mean, the big thing is uh, for a child, you want to use um, the, the outer thigh of both yourself or, or the child. So think about that. I mean, for want of a better term, the media, medius part of the leg. So again, I think about, you know, thinking about a pant crease as a border and a pant seam. So it's that outer thigh. And you think about the middle part. So if you think about dividing the upper leg into thirds, so it's the middle third outer thigh. Okay. And again, depending on the device, depending on the device, different devices have different methods. Either you, for the the EpiPen, you pull off the the um, the blue cap and blue to the sky, orange to the thigh. You press and you hold to your hair click for three seconds. For the Allerject, it's going to be the same, although the Allerject does have voice prompts. But it's the same, the same thing. You would, you press and you would hold. It counts down for you. And once it's, once it's counted down, you would remove the device. The big thing about children is stabilizing that leg so that they can't move too much. So again, we usually talk about, you know, you know, having the child sitting on your knee, and then you have have the leg stabilized between your legs as well, so you can stabilize it so that that they're not going to be able to move a whole lot. And again, once it's used, the, the issue is, is you think about keeping your head and your heart at the same level. So again, because of that circulation issues, if, if there is, you know, if there's um, ideally, you'd, you'd have, you'd be lying flat uh, with your feet elevated. If you're nauseated, you could lie on your left or right side. And again, it's keeping the head and the heart at the same level so that the heart doesn't have to work as hard to get, to get blood to your head. Okay. Okay, now I know we've got a lot of questions uh, from the audience on in antihistamines, but I want to just finish off a couple more around epinephrine and signs and symptoms before we go on to that. So I just want to let our audience know we hear your questions and we will get to those. Okay, so um, just to, uh, back to signs and symptoms, and I, I overlooked this one and I apologize, but can you help us distinguish between um, uh, an anxiety and panic versus uh, anaphylaxis. Sure, and I think that that's, that's really important. And it's again, because, um, I, I mean, you know, certainly people are gonna be worried if they, if they, they you know, they, if they think that they've been exposed. So the issue with regards to that is you said, if you look at um, in, 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 in sort of what we call a vasovagal type reaction, which is that feeling like headed fainting, the heart rate slows down and doesn't speed up. The breathing, it's, it's, the, the breathing tends to become more shallow and, and slow. And the, uh, because uh, again, during that episode, people may be feeling, feeling lightheaded, but their skin gets more pale and discolored. They usually don't have, they will not have any hives, that sort of thing. And so it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the heart rate, the, the, the breathing actually slows down and they become sort of more ashen and pale in color. Okay. Now, um, if you've got a speeding heart rate, is there an issue with using epinephrine? So if you're already having a, a uh, you know, you, you're anxious, is that going to lessen the effect of epinephrine or is that an issue in safety? No, it's not. I mean, the issue is, is that what you're, I mean, your heart rate in, in anaphylaxis increases. So what you're trying to do is you want that heart, 
you want your heart to be more efficient. So right. you you want you you want to stabilize your vessels so you get more blood that's circulating. You want a stronger contraction, and you want your blood pressure supported. So actually, you know that initial effect may be an increase in heart rate, but because you're you're actually reversing the reaction, then those the the rap, that rapid heart rate should slow down. Okay. And then the last question related to um, the use of epinephrine is, you know, how significant are the risks associated with cardiac arrest? I think that's one of the concerns and hesitancies ca that came up at the beginning. So I'm not quite sure. Cardiac arrest for use of epinephrine? Yeah. Are, are there risks associated of cardiac arrest with the use of epinephrine? So, you know, the only time that that's even a concern is when it is very large dose. Which would be, which tends would not happen with the standard devices that we would use, or if they, if if it's been given inappropriately directly into a vein, so you get a bolus of this epinephrine going directly to the heart. But that's not something that would be happening in in the community. It would be in the emergency department, perhaps that somebody has been given an inappropriate dose in an IV. But but that would be the only situations. Okay. Okay, let's move on to antihistamines because the, this one is uh, one that, a very hot topic right now. So, um, is there value to using Benadryl in any situation? In any any allergy situation? Yes, any allergy situation. <laughs> no. Okay. Our Canadian Society of Allergy and Clinical Immunology came up with a position statement. The Benadryl formulation in Canada is diphenhydramine. It's a first-generation antihistamine. Um, it, if you go in, in in a pharmacy, you know Benadryl's diphenhydramine. If you go down the down a little bit further, you will find Gravol, which is diphenhydronate. So it's very similar preparation. So a first-generation antihistamine is not very it's not, it's not a very efficient antihistamine it crosses the blood brain barrier it causes significant sedation and so i you know honestly i i i talk to my family each and every time benadryl is one of those standard things it's like kleenex tissues you know it's been it's been around forever but the formulation in canada there are far better antihistamines that are non-sedating in an allergic reaction or you know in a anaphylactic reaction as i talked about i mean really the only thing that you're doing when you're using an antihistamine is perhaps reducing highs but you're not doing anything else to reverse those major signs and symptoms and for other you know for other types of of allergies for you know itchy skin related to to um you know, hives or that sort of thing, a non-sedating antihistamine, something that doesn't across it and enter the brain is more appropriate. So, I mean, honestly, I can't think of any situation where where Benadryl would be my first choice for, for anything. Okay, so so then it begs the question, and, and it's one that's been asked several times, is why do we continue to hear from uh, physicians uh, that we should be using Benadryl, right? Like what's... And you know, even because, even in ER situations where there's Benadryl. So, I would hope that the, the pediatric emergency departments in Canada, with these new, with this track, which is that translating um, uh, research in the emergency department, that that should not be an issue because because the uh, the recommendations are to, are are not to use uh, Benadryl at our own institution. We're working um, very hard to actually remove. Benadryl from from the hospital, uh, and that uh, only under very ex ex limited um, situations would Benadryl be available. But by I think by the end of this year, early next year, um, there will be very there will be in most places Benadryl would just not be available. And I think it's an education component, and I think that that that's the big thing. And and again. Um, you know, it's 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 when people think antihistamines, they think Benadryl. Yeah. They just it's a great brand recognition. And as I said, in you know, in Canada, in the in the U.S., it's that diphenhydramine. But for example, in Europe, they they actually have a different uh, formulation, which is non-sedating. But they're using that brand recognition uh, for for people. But um, it I just think it's an education piece, and I hope that um, 
should become less and less of an issue over time. Okay, so it's not Benadryl. Uh, second generation antihistamines are better. Let's talk about, we, you know, we, we, we don't necessarily, uh, we relate to, to brands, okay? So let's talk about what are those second generation or third generation antihistamines that you would recommend? And what so is the underlying Recommending action? for anaphylaxis? Well, you know, recommend, how, where would you recommend in food allergy and anaphylaxis, where, if at all, would you recommend second generation and what is it doing in, in underlying, like what, when you get to a second generation so, antihistamine, what role are they playing in your system? So again, I would come back to the various antihistamines in anaphylaxis. The only symptom that you're treating is the hive. Okay, that's not, a, you're not going to, even giving large doses of antihistamines, you're not going to impact the breathing, you're not going to impact the circulation, you're, and, and you're not going to impact uh, on the um, uh, severe GI symptoms. So in anaphylaxis, the role of an antihistamine is secondary, not primary. I mean, the, the, the again, it's the Epinephrine is your treatment of choice. Epinephrine is going to reverse those signs and symptoms. So, you know, certainly if a child um, is in the emergency department, they're being treated and they're still itchy and uncomfortable, using a second generation such as cetirizine or reactine, Arius or Claritin, that can be used for secondary treatment of the discomfort because of the itch. But the mainstay is still the epinephrine. Got it. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Okay, now um, there are a couple of questions. We've got some dietitians that are that have uh, are listening in, and they have um, are very involved in early introduction of allergenic foods. And so, um, some of the questions around that is is how can we uh, help prepare them for potential allergic reactions when introducing to infants? Or what's your recommendation just in that space? So again, it's it's a matter of, I mean, the risk is small. I mean, that's the most important thing. And the whole issue is that whole change in recommendations. I mean, we used to think avoiding of these highly allergenic foods was beneficial. We now have found the actual, the actual opposite thing is true. But again, it's like it's like a new food. You try small amounts and you're looking for, I mean, you know, you would look for those signs and symptoms of, of a reaction. And again, you know, certainly, uh, if there are any concerning reactions, then that's the, the, the food should be stopped uh, and there needs to be an assessment by somebody to be able to decide whether or not this is allergic or not. I see very, I mean, I have a number of referrals recently with children who are introducing, you know, new foods and this concerns, they get a little bit of redness around their mouth, so people are very worried. Vast majority of the time, that's not allergic, it's not an allergic reaction, but those, you know, at least, you know, their recognition of the symptoms and we would look at it. But again, it's hives, swelling lips, mouth or tongue, any significant breathing problems, sudden changes in abdominal discomfort. It's all of those things that you would, that you would look for. And again, it's a matter of you start, start with small amounts and you progress, uh, you know, in a logical fashion. And one food at a time so that you can ensure that you you know which food if, ha if a problem happens which food was it so that you can be a little bit more educated that way okay so uh i'm going to just two final questions okay um and what i guess one isn't necessarily a question it's asking you to kind of do a bit of a, a, a s summary of the uh, how to define anaphylaxis so there was a question around um, life-threatening, that the understanding that anaphylaxis is always life-threatening, but in this present presentation, we talked about it, it may be life-threatening or right. it may not be life-threatening. So Correct. just kind of restate that piece for us, because I think that there is this, this uh, tendency to go anaphylaxis equals life-threatening. And, that, and that's important to understand that. It may be, but the issue is, is recognizing so again, if you have two systems, you've got hives and you and you start vomiting, that's anaphylaxis. So whether or not it's mild, moderate, severe, it's anaphylaxis. Okay, you treat it. And again, it, you know, if if you've got a known exposure to an allergic trigger, you have significant breathing problems. By definition, that's anaphylaxis. 
you treat it. So again, it, this it's it's not necessarily the severity; it's the combination of the the two systems with the skin plus one other system. That's anaphylaxis you treat. Whether or not it's you know calling it mild, moderate, or severe, it's kind of like being mild, moderate, or severely pregnant. You just it's it's anaphylaxis. You treat it, and that and I just wanted people to get. And again, I mean, it's it, you want to treat it early because you want to reverse it. So to me, and, and it's so it's not every anaphylaxis does not equal life threatening. There is a spectrum, but the issue is you you treat it the same. You know, and I think I think you know people are worried because it's a needle, that sort of thing. But the issue is that's the treatment. You practice, you recognize, and you use it, and that's that's just that's that's the appropriate thing that you do. And you know, some people may have symptoms that you know, in hindsight, well, you know, was that was that enough? If you have two body systems, that is skin plus something else, that's enough. If you have a known exposure, you have have significant breathing issues or concerning breathing issues, that's enough to treat. Okay, okay. perfect. You know what? I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to ask you, we're going to turn off our webcams. I'd like you to walk through some of the key takeaway slides, and then I will uh, wrap it up on my end as well. Great. So thank you very much. And again, I just wanted to come back to the key messages because I sometimes, you know, when we, the question is sort of, we sort of lose touch with what was sort of the important, uh, important key messages. And so I leave you with these two key messages. If you think an allergic reaction is anaphylaxis, use epinephrine. You will not cause significant harm by using epinephrine. Right, just look at the next the next slide, please. So hopefully the overall goals. I hope I've been able to to empower you to respond to suspected allergic reactions and help increase confidence about your decisions to use the epinephrine auto injector. And just to review the objectives that have that we've had. So I hope you've been able you'll be able to describe the signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis describe the reasons for epinephrine being first-line treatment, discuss the roles of antihistamines in the treatment of anaphylaxis, and the importance of early recognition uh, of, and treatment of anaphylaxis. And I hope these cases gave you some, some actual, you know, so you can actually think more concretely and, and hopefully that helped with your comfort level in managing possible allergic reactions. And with that, I, I thank you very much. I appreciate the, the, the time. With you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Watson. We really appreciate you spending time uh, when uh, it's uh, particularly busy for the, the healthcare sector. So I'd like to go back to the poll that we started with at the start of the session and in, in kind of gauging how comfortable you are in recognizing signs and symptoms and the using of epinephrine auto injectors and, uh, and see how, how we've uh, helped move the mark. Okay, have we got some results? Okay, we have we've, we have moved many people to the comfortable and the very comfortable, and we still have some work to do to help support those that are sitting in the somewhat and not comfortable uh, uh, mode. So a couple of things, um, two more things I'd like to mention. First is, as you know, if you've participated in our webinars before, you're going to get a short survey through GoToWebinar immediately after this. It'll pop up on your screen, and we would really like you to complete it. You'll also get a survey uh, in an email in the next hour. Please take some time to fill it in. Your feedback is crucial, and it helps inform our future webinars, as well as understand the additional questions you may have. Um, and all of you now are in a position to get involved in our Know It, Treat It campaign. So we, during the month of May for Food Allergy Awareness Month, we have a contest running and we have the opportunity to win one of three prizes. Uh, it is a Know It, Treat It contest in which it's all about sharing the signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis and its treatment. Tell us how you knew you were having an anaphylactic reaction and how you treated it. And if you don't have to have had an anaphylactic reaction to, to participate, if you haven't had a reaction, share with us how you would recognize and treat it. Because the goal of this campaign is really about empowering Canadians uh, around recognizing treating anaphylaxis through real life stories and education. So we encourage you to get involved. Um, in terms of our uh, support for this uh, webinar, I would like to thank our sponsors. As you know, Food Allergy Canada is a not-for-profit charity, and we are very reliant on our donations for the support for the work that we do. And so if you can consider a donation to our organization, we would greatly appreciate it. 
You can visit foodallergycanada.ca backslash donate to learn more about our impact. And we would like to thank uh, our sponsors for our ongoing webinar series, the Walter and Maria Schroeder Foundation, the Sean Delaney Memorial Golf Classic, EpiPen, and the Peanut Bureau of Canada. So thank you for your participation in today's webinar. You can view a recording of this webinar at foodallergycanada.ca shortly, and please also share it with others who you think may benefit from this content. This now concludes our webinar.